talking about uh, Rosetta Flash. Uh, just a very quick reminder that um, when you finish, when talk's finished and you've given all the applause, on your way out, remember there's a box up there with some red and green cards. If you love the talk, grab one of the green cards, put it in. If you didn't like the talk, in the unlikely event you didn't like, go for the red card, but please, yeah, green cards in the boxes, that's what we like to see. Okay, thank you very much. It's Mikhail. Um, hi, everybody. I like green, just saying. So uh, I'm here to present uh, Rosetta Flash. And actually, Rosetta Flash is, um, uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah. It's an exploitation technique that it, uh, it's almost a year old. So this talk will uh, actually focus, well, of course, on what it is, but also on what still works, what was not fixed, what was not fixed properly, and how it is also useful now, how it can be useful now. And um, so I think most of you are uh, already um, knowledgeable about JSONP and what JSONP is. So I'm, just to know how much time to, uh, to allocate on that, I was, I'm wondering how many of you know what JSONP is? If you can raise your hand. OK. Great, I will just make a very short introduction then. Uh, but, um, so basically there is this great technology. Oh, okay. It probably doesn't like. Let's try again. Uh, okay, great. So JSONP is this great technology to bypass same origin policy normally, right? So basically, if you want to embed a script uh, from uh, another domain, you can do it with the script tag, right? Um, but, and this is exactly what JSONP uh, exploits, right? So if you want to execute JavaScript from another region and uh, you don't want to use uh, uh, you know, like the proper uh, way of doing that, you can use a hack, and this hack is uh, embedding an external uh, uh, script, which is, for example, this one on LinkedIn.com, www.linkedin.com, count, serve, count, share, and specify a callback. In this, in this case, it's reflected callback, right? And the content of the reply will be at the beginning, reflected callback, which is the function specified, and then some data that is passed across the region, right? It's the only important thing about uh, JSONP that it's I mean, really important, crucial to understand Rosetta, is that the attacker controls the first bytes of the response, right? So you specify in a URL parameter the callback, and that callback is the first bytes of the response. Okay? So I try again to... Ah, yes, it works. Great. So, but Rosetta Flash is about Flash, right? It's about Flash files. So Flash files normally are binary. And they are binary blobs. And uh, in the callback parameter of JSONP endpoints, you can generally only specify alphanumeric characters, not binary bytes. So uh, w it would be cool if you could uh, transform any Swift file to an alphanumeric one. And this is what Rosetta Flash is. Rosetta Flash is a tool that converts any Flash file to an uh, equivalent one that is made only of alphanumeric characters. And why? Because as I said, uh, there are different things that come into play. As I said, first, uh, with JSONP, an attacker can control the first bytes by the callback parameter. And second, flash files have this uh, particular, peculiar implementation of same origin policy. So if you can upload a flash file to a domain, uh, that flash file can do authenticated requests to that domain, which means cookie caring with cookies, right? Can read the requests and can also exfiltrate the results to an attacker domain. And this is by design, right? 
what we want to achieve is to uh, have this without uh, allowing a new, if a user is not allowed to upload flash files on that domain. So we're using a JSONP endpoint to reflect a flash file. Because the flash parser is actually very liberal and discards everything uh, that it comes after a valid flash file. So we just need to control the beginning of a response. And that's exactly what JSONP is. JSONP allows an attacker to specify the first bytes. But we need them to be alphanumeric, right? So if we just create an HTML page on attacker.com with an object tag with content type uh, application extra wave flash and specify victim.com slash JSONP endpoint callback the flash file, it's exactly equivalent to having that flash file hosted on victim.com. Yeah, as I said, normally flash files are binary. And how is it possible to make them alphanumeric? Like, it's kind of magic. Uh, well, it's possible with compression. And not really with normal compression, but by abusing compressions. So flash files can be uncompressed or compressed in two different ways, actually, when we see. But first, this is a valid flash file. And it's made just of ASCII, alphanumeric, actually. And it is a recrawl. Uh, I would love to show it to you right now, but actually I, I shared with this with Adobe and they fixed it. But not only that, uh, if you um, have an antivirus software and you visit that, it gets flagged because they added a recrawl to their vi virus definitions. And sometimes they say W32, not sure why, Trojan recrawl. So, this is just how antivirus vendor work, right? It's a bit weird. So let's just suppose that we have two domains, victim.com and attacker.com. So victim.com has a vulnerable, well, working as intended, uh, JSONP endpoint that just reflects the callback, right? This is PHP mostly because PHP is simple to write. I don't love PHP, but uh, th this just checks that the get callback is just uh, made of uh, alphanumeric and underscore, which is this backslash W in the regular expression. And it reflects it, right? And then adds open parentheses, open mm, like, uh, brackets stuff. Then an attacker can add on his malicious page on attacker.com an object type application extra quick flash and in data victim.com vulnerable JSON P callback and the alphanumeric flash file. Right? So the JSON P endpoint will reflect the alphanumeric flash files. It will be uh, the browser will think it is a valid flash file because we force the application extra quick flash content type with the object tag. And well, then we have some other, some other uh, values in the flash variables, because actually this is no longer a recrawl. Uh, this is a universal exfiltrator. So this is um, uh, very, let's say, weaponized in a way, uh, proof of concept, uh, where uh, you can specify a URL you want to access with the victim's uh, credentials, so with the cookies and everything, and where to exfiltrate the content, OK? So you, it accepts like a URL var variable, that you're in the same domain of the vulnerable endpoint to perform a GET request to, and exfiltrate an attack control URL to which post a variable with the exfiltrated data. Uh, on my GitHub, which is that one, there are several more. You can execute arbitrary flash code. So there is an eval, for example, action script, which is ready to download. And almost all of the web, modern web, uh, was or is vulnerable. So uh, Google, Yahoo, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, everything. Um, just because they use JSONP, right? They don't do anything wrong. They just use JSONP. And the combinations of these things create a vulnerability. Facebook and GitHub were actually safe uh, because they already employed the mitigation thinking that one day it might be possible to have alphanumeric flash files. And so they were very, let's say, prudent in that. In particular, I, I, I would like to, to thank uh, Alok, uh, like ex Facebook security, uh, who wrote a great uh, blog post uh, about trying to achieve alphanumeric flash files. That was a great inspiration for me. And that's also why he patched Facebook, basically. 
um, Google in particular was uh, vulnerable on important domains such as www or accounts. So accounts.com could exfiltrate the tokens, for example, so you could take over an account. Uh, books, maps, and they're all fixed, and we'll see how. So a step back now. Um, this is basically how a Swift header looks like. There are three types of flash files. Uh, an uncompressed one, a zlib compressed one, and a zdmo compressed one. ZMA, sorry. Um, so it first starts with Swift reversed, FWS, or C for compressed, if it is compressed with zlib, or well, Z if it is ZMA. ZMA. But uh, we can ignore the uncompressed and the ZMA because we will focus on Zlib. What is Zlib? Uh, Zlib is uh, basically a wrapper over deflate with a header and a checksum, right, for integrity. Uh, we'll see later if you are uh, into specifications, uh, you can read uh, RFC 1951. And then you have to read 1950, which is deflate, because basically Zlib says, uh, Yes, it's deflate with a header, so you have to get back and read and study deflate. Um, one very good thing is that flash parsers are very liberal, so they allow invalid fields. So for example, in the uh, version field, you can put like an alphanumeric character and it will accept it. Same for file length. Uh, well, you, you don't have to put a very high uh, byte as the rightmost because it's the most significant one and if you specify a very high one uh, at least in Chrome it would not uh, execute because it would try to allocate too much memory and then it would refuse to execute but that's I mean you can put a zero which is fine for us and it is the lowest allowed uh, ASCII right and it would work right so you can put like channel zero and then you have the zlib data right that incorporates also a checksum so we have we want to make it completely alphanumeric and we want to make the checksum alphanumeric too, right? Because it is part of the file. So we already see that we have levels of, uh, uh, it's a, a bit meta, right? Because we want to create something that is alphanumeric and we want to define inside of it uh, tables for the decompressor to make it alphanumeric. And the tables themselves, because they are embedded, have to be alphanumeric. And the checksum has to be alphanumeric. So it's a bit difficult. It's a difficult problem. So well, basically, deflate does two things, duplicate string elimination and bit reduction. I really don't want to spend uh, time on the details of deflate because I think it, they would um, actually take away a bit from the big picture. Uh, and uh, it's, but feel free to ask me anything, like uh, whenever, I would love to. So basically, Zlib uh, has this header. So uh, this, the first byte is basically compression method. And uh, for the uh, four bits, and then for um, the, the other four bits, uh, compression info. Uh, so good news, we can make the first byte to be uh, an alphanumeric character. Uh, which is compliant with the format. So for example, lowercase h is fine. Uh, it's, it's an eight for compression method, and uh, the second one is actually a, well, a window, but uh, it works. The second one is a little bit more tricky because it's basically a, a, also a little bit like a checksum. Uh, it has to have a modulus 31, which is equal zero together with the, with the byte before. So uh, I just run a very simple script to try to brute force the possibilities. And it looks like H, lowercase h, and capital C is good. It works. It's a valid Zlib signature. It's one of the very few, actually, that are valid. So we got that part sorted. So we have a valid Zlib header. We used to have a valid uh, Swift header, right, because the parser is relaxed. And now we have a valid Zlib header. Then. Inside there is deflate, right? And deflate is um, uh, a block compressor. So you have uh, several blocks, and each block is a kind of a matrioska, right? Uh, has the first bit, which is, is, is it the last block? Then we have uh, uh, 
like two bits that say this is dynamic Huffman, so you specify your own tables. For what a table is, feel free to look at the specification. It's basically something that translates bytes to other bytes, and this is something that we'll, be, we'll use. Uh, in this case, it always has to be dynamic Huffman. Then there are some numbers, some counters of the number of literals, number of lengths. We won't go too much into detail. Then there are three tables. Uh, the most important one is the first one, the length of lengths, uh, which says uh, translated this code to that other code. And then there are, well, two more. And then there is an endo-block code, OK? So we don't care about compression. Actually, what we are doing is mapping a binary file to, uh, to another file that is made of a more restrictive char set. So it can't be a compression, right? Uh, it has to be an inflation, uh, because we are basically reducing the entropy of the, well, the, the char set, right? Uh, so we are actually using a compressor to inflate something. This is already a bit weird. Uh, but not only that, we also have, we have well, two main problems. Uh, creating a, a, a table, uh, tables actually, that work, so they guarantee that the output is alphanumeric, and making sure that the checksum itself is uh, alphanumeric. The checksum is uh, of the uncompressed Swift file. Okay. And how does the checksum work? It's an Adler 32 checksum, uh, which is a very lightweight checksum. It's not polynomial based, so it's not like CRC, for example. It's just two rolling sums, two two bytes uh, rolling sums, S1 and S2. So for every byte, it it's, can also work as a rolling sum, so it can be computed dynamically, right? Um, for each byte you add, you add, for each byte B you add, you add B to the first rolling sum, S1. And then you add S1 to S2. And S1 and S2 are, of course, uh, modulus uh, 65521, which is the largest prime, uh, less than 2 to the power of 16. So we want to make both S1 and S2 alphanumeric. And we, can co we control the original uncompressed Swift files. As if you remember, I told you that uh, the flash parser ignores any uh, trailing byte at the end of a valid flash file. So we can append every byte we want. So it, we, can, we can exploit this malleability to create a ad hoc uh, checksum, right? But what is the, um, cle the most clever way of doing that? So just one way of doing that, and that's what I used, is having a high byte sled, in this case FE, for example, so that we overflow S1. So we want S1 to be alphanumeric, so uh, alphanumeric is usually um, a kind of low byte value, right, because of the ASCII table. So we overflow it, and then we add the first delta, which is delta 1, delta one just to make S1 what we want to be, like an A, a B, whatever, right? Then we want to, to keep S1 fixed, because we want to update S2 and make it uh, also alphanumeric, but we don't want to also change S1. So a very simple way for not changing S1 is adding null bytes. Because every time you add a byte, it adds to S1. So if you add 0, it, S1 doesn't change, right? So if we add 0, S2 becomes S2 equal S2 plus S1, OK? Uh, and then we can add another delta. We can call uh, delta 2 uh, that basically gets uh, the S2 we want. So it's actually pretty easy with this uh, sled technique to get uh, an alphanumeric checksum. So now that we know that we can uh, manipulate the file to get a checksum, uh, that how we want it to be, uh, we need to use Huffman to actually uh, encode uh, the, the file to be uh, alphanumeric. So to get uh, bytes, binary bytes, and transform them. So uh, I use two different encoders. Um, and uh, uh, credits for the tables go to uh, Gabor Moller. Uh, they, uh, so basically, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, so uh, for example, code 16, I put length 2. This means that code 16 becomes 0, 0, which is the first in lexicographic order for a length 2 code. But anyway. 
Uh, the thing is, this thing tells the decompressor how it should decompress, but also the table itself has to be alphanumeric because it's included. So that was pretty hard to achieve. It was something like really, really, really hard to achieve. Uh, and we don't care about efficiency. We don't care about uh, functionality. We just want something which is valid and that generates alphanumeric bytes. So we, need, we, we, we care about the um, disalignments, what I call disalignments. So we want, in a way, it's like kind of poetry. Uh, we want a kind of rhythm that every uh, beat after eight bits, it returns a character if you cut there, right? So for example, sometimes I had to specify something in the table uh, that uh, does not do anything, just to make the table itself be alphanumeric. Okay, actually most of the table is unused. It's just to make it alphanumeric. So this is how it looks. Uh, thanks to Frank Yellen, by the way, for this uh, debugger, who greatly helped me in uh, developing this. Um, if you don't know, Frank Yellen is one of the Java guys, one of the creators of Java. Uh, it made runtime exception. <laughs> if you hover on uh, Eclipse on runtime exception, you see his name. It's pretty cool. So um, you can see that basically after the columns, you see that byte in ASCII what it is. So what we care about is uh, making them alphanumeric. And you can, you can see that, for example, the first one is a zero, then there is a P, uh, and uh, oh, yes, also the, the bit order is a bit weird. Sometimes it's LSB, sometimes it's MSB, so sometimes it's, it's just a bit weird, because it, it, inside of Deflate there are some things that are in MSB order, sometimes they are in LSB order. But anyway, uh, you see that, for example, we have uh, D, 0, U, P, 0, right? And this is what it has to do. So uh, basically wrapping it up, um, we have a signature, and uh, the signature is ASCII, and that's fine. We have a version, and we can put whatever we want there. So that's ASCII. That's alphanumeric. And we have a file length, same. The zlib data, it's alphanumeric thanks to the tables. And the checksum is alphanumeric because we can manipulate the original slash files by adding bytes at the end, right? So with the sled and delta uh, techniques. So mitigations, I would like to talk about uh, mitigations because this is, uh, actually, um, is it kind of clear what is said so far? Because it's kind of complex and I don't want to dive in too much into the details, but really feel free to ask me everything, especially at the end, if you want. So uh, it's very hard to mitigate this because it's basically nobody's fault. It's kind of a confused deputy's problem. Um, so it's not Adobe's fault, right? Because that's just the format. Uh, it's not the browser's fault because, well, plugins. It's not website operator's fault because JSONP works like that. JSONP is supposed to, to reflect the callback, right? So it's, I think Rosetta is a great example of how combining several things that work as they should work can create a vulnerability. I contacted um, Adobe uh, in May of 2014 uh, when I discovered and I had a working uh, universal proof of concept. And um, they uh, pushed this fix, um, which I couldn't check, but it was pushed after almost two months because there were there was the World Cup, so uh, they were afraid of breaking uh, the Flash player. Because <laughs> everybody was, was, was apparently, especially in South America, everybody was watching uh, like with Flash the final. So I understand that, priorities, right? So what it did is check the first eight bytes of the file. And if there is at least one JSON P disallowed character, which is a string definition, then the Swift file is considered safe and no further check. Otherwise, it, they check the first 4K of the file. And if there is at least one JSONP disallowed character, the file is considered safe. Otherwise, it's considered unsafe, and it's not executing it. 
Okay. This was not this was not enough. So the JSON-PD's allowed list was basically the negation of alphanumeric and point and underscore. But this is too broad for most real-world JSONP endpoints. Because a lot of them, for example, allow the uh, dollar sign because of jQuery and other uh, fancy JavaScript uh, library. So if you add a dollar sign to the allowed trusted of Rosetta Flash, uh, you would bypass the fix very easily. But you actually don't have to do that. There is a slightly more subtle way of uh, doing that. It's by exploiting something that naturally occurs in the response of a JSONP endpoint, which is a parenthesis. So after the callback, there is always, in the reflected callback, there is always an open parenthesis because the callback is a function, right? So what you can do, and what is the last byte of the flash file? It's the least significant byte of the checksum. But what is said is that the checksum, you control the checksum. The attacker controls the, checks, the checksum. So we can make an, uh, a flash file that has the last byte has an open parenthesis. We can. And what can we do if we do that? We would pass to the callback the flash file except the last one, except the open parenthesis, right? Which would be there in the response, so it would work anyway. And so we would have a response with a full value sweep file, and it would work. It would bypass the fix, because it would see there is an open parenthesis, which is JSONP is allowed, and it's not in the request, it's not in the parameters, so it would bypass the fix. So the fix was bypassed, like, uh, actually, in one hour of work into looking at that. And so there is a better way of, do, of fixing it, and this is the current one. Um, I don't have access to Flash source code. So I had to do it the hard way. But luckily, they have symbols for the debug edition. So check header. You know, uh, you can see what is that check JSON bytes. You can see that there was a fix for, for, for Rosetta here. So what is they're doing now? It's a much better thing. They are looking for content type, application extra wave flash. And if there is, it's considered safe. Wait, this means the content type returned by the server. Because a JSONP response, typically, it's an uh, um, application JSON content type that is overridden by what you specify in the object HTML tag. So you are forcing a content type. Okay? So if it's natural, the server naturally returns an uh, application X showway flash, it probably means that it's a legitimate flash file. So this is a preliminary check. Then they're checking the first eight bytes. And if any bytes is greater or equal than 0x80, which is non-ASCII, then OK, then the 4K, OK. Otherwise, it's unsafe, it's not executed. This is much better, because uh, they are not basically blacklisting. They are kind of whitelisting, in a way, right? And this is much more robust. Last time I presented this, I said that's end game, right? <laughs> and we should talk about mitigations by website owners. But actually, it's not enough. This is not enough. This can be not enough. So uh, can you think of a way in which um, something that is actually has at least one byte which is greater or equal than 0x80 uh, would still be text in a way? Can you think of anything? Unicode, right? UTF-8. So UTF-8 has sequences of bytes, right? So if we have, we have for example, two sequence bytes, uh, sorry, two byte sequence, uh, it can easily be that one of the two is like C0, for example, right? And the other is something else. So if the JSONP endpoint allows UTF-8 characters in the callback, then we can very easily bypass this. Because for example, a, a, a E with an accent, it's like C0 something. So if the JSONP endpoint allows it, then we bypass it. And it works right now. Um, you might say, why should a JSONP endpoint accept UTF-8? Right? But they do. Actually, I would say like 20% do. OK? Uh, even in very important services. And I'm not saying which one. <laughs> but very important ones. 
So what can web, web, website owners do to mitigate this? Because uh, nobody will, not enough people will, fla will, will touch uh, Flash, right? Mostly because it's, it's hard, the, the, the adoption curve, I mean the, the update curve for Adobe Flash is pretty uh, slow. And that's because, mostly because, uh, well, it's hard to update, it's hard to keep, update, to keep updated. Uh, on Windows, there are software bundled with Flash updates, which make a lot of people, even uh, savvy users, decide not to update it because they, they don't want to install McAfee, for example, together with that. So what you can do as a website owner, you can return content disposition attachment, which, makes, which forces a download of a JSONP response, which is perfectly fine for its normal use, but it prevents plugins to interpret and execute, at least since uh, Flash Player 10.2. Or you can do something which is actually what most uh, sites are doing and fr web frameworks are doing, so Google, Facebook, and also um, um, Ruby on Rails, MediaWiki, they all fix it this way, to prepend an empty comment block like this before the reflected callback. So basically you would uh, uh, make it not a valid flash file because you control the first bytes and you no longer control the first bytes. Even a space would be enough. So even if you return space reflected callback, the attack would not work. Okay? Uh, in some cases, X content type options no sniff also prevents plugins for interpreting this as flash. Not always. So this is not the best thing. So um, in conclusion, um, I think this uh, exploitation techniques that allows basically exfiltration of data, XSRF, and same origin policy bypass uh, demonstrates that it's not always easy to blame uh, vulnerability on somebody. It's very hard to see who's the culprit of this. Uh, it, it's, um, it could have been solved uh, at different stages, like when parsing the flash file, for example, uh, but you don't have to be over, uh, st overly strict because otherwise you would break legitimate flash files. So that was Adobe's main concern and that's very understandable, right? Uh, by the plugins or the browsers, by, for example, employing strict content type checks, so refusing to execute if content type is not shockwave flash, but then a lot of web browsers have broken content types. A lot of web browsers, for example, return application octet, octet stream for uh, flash files. So that would break really a lot of things. Or, uh, of course, website owners. Website owners could uh, prefix anything to the reflected callback. Anything that is, of course, semantically void in JavaScript uh, to the reflected callback. And um, with this, I am done. And I really hope to have a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, so Adobe fixed that. Well, it depends. Okay, so it's um, uh, uh, Rosetta Flash has this variable, which is allowed char set. Right now, it is restricted to alphanumeric and underscore and dot. So like this, it would not work because Adobe would refuse to execute such a valid Flash file that is made only of those characters, right? Uh, it's like a, basically a stubborn uh, kid. But if you have, for example, a UTF-8 accepting JSONP endpoint, what you can do is putting uh, all valid two sequences Unicode in that variable, allowed char set, and then it would work because Flash is not blocking that, right? I mean, the only thing that, ma that's, that makes it not work is the fix by Adobe and by website owners by prefixing. So for example, if you check Facebook, Google, Twitter, uh, they no longer return uh, they no longer return the callback without anything before them. But for example, some websites do, uh, still. But um, for example, LinkedIn decided not to prefix anything, but they added a no sniff header, which is enough for modern browsers, not for old. Uh, 
Uh, and then like credit cards companies do not care. I reported both of them like one year ago. <laughs> but uh, LinkedIn uh, replied. American Express did it. But my, my question is, mm -hmm. the tool that you have on GitHub, yeah. uh, does it allow you to configure like the UTF-8 character set so that the Adobe... It's just a variable, allowed char set. And if okay. you put there, for example, uh, a range instead of thing, it, 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 then you can run it and it will generate something that okay. has... Well, it used to, it, it can be click and go very easily. I mean, it's just one line of, just putting a UTF-8. Yes, exactly. Because okay. I'm not distributing, I mean, I'm a responsible researcher, I'm not distributing. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's just a test where this uh, could be a vulnerability. No. Well, there are actually several places where it could be a, a, still a real vulnerability. So, for example, uh, I've been told that, uh, for example, the load movie in Swift files, uh, it looks like it's not checking, doing the same checks. So if you have a, a Swift file which you can, in which you can inject uh, the content of a load movie call, load movie basically loads a Swift file and executes it. It's basically the eval of Flash. Uh, no, well, it's not an eval. It's an embed of Flash, right? Uh, it's, it looks like you can use it for having, for basically bypassing the same origin policy if you have such a scenario. But then you would have to have a vulnerable flash files in the first place. Yeah. Well, this applies to anything and everything. Right. Other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, if you want the technical details, uh, where can you find them? Oh, okay. So basically, if you go to my uh, blog posts, uh, you search for Rosetta Flash, the first result, uh, it, you will see more. So you'll see a little bit more technical details. Um, also, the RFCs for deflates are useful. And ultimately, read the code of Rosetta Flash. It's Go. So you might, you might learn a new fancy language, too. And uh, feel free. Uh, it's not too complex, also. It's, uh, it has something a bit hard-coded, but I tried to comment the code. So it's commented. So, yeah. Please. Was there anything different that needed to be done to make the, like, to make the Zlib and the checksum data pass validation for UTF-8 versus anything under OF-80, like just versus under ASCII? Uh, no, it's completely the same. Yeah. Because you can add arbitrary content at the end, so you, it really doesn't depend on what was there. Okay. You could have anything. Right. And you would eventually overflow it and get to, down to the value you want. It's, it doesn't matter, yeah. No, no, it's completely the same. Uh, really, you just really have to change one variable. Everything else works. It's the, um, it, yeah. Also because, also because the, that checksum is of the uncompressed Swift files, which was binary. Right. It was not ASCII in the first place, right? So it's the most general case you can. Anything else? Thank you.